Okay, we have our next speaker here, Carlos uh, from Santiago, Chile, uh, also King's College, right? Um, he's going to be filling us in on his, uh, is this a new package? Relatively new? Yeah, new package uh, about uh, MRI simulations. Take it away, Carlos. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, well, I'll start uh, asking, how many people here know what MRI is? Like, raise your hand. Okay, some of you know. How many of you have been inside an MRI? Okay, more than I expected. And how many of you know actually what's happening? <laughs> Maybe not, yeah, okay, uh, some. Uh, okay, so I, I know my public here is not MRI experts, right? So I will not be uh, going straight to the code. I, I will explain what MRI is. Okay. okay. Uh, I will uh, explain briefly what MRI is and why should you care about MRI, why MRI simulations are useful, and then how I uh, use Julia to basically create an MRI simulator that satisfies all my needs. And probably that part is the um, part that will be more um, important for you. But let's start slow. So first, the introduction about MRI, then why it's useful, then coma, or my simulator, and how I approach this with Julia, and a little bit about the open source MRI ecosystem. OK, so what? What is MRI? MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging, is a type of um, medical image or that is particularly tomographic, so you can see the body from the inside. And by varying magnetic fields, that's why it's called magnetic resonance imaging, you can change uh, some properties of the tissue and measure uh, inside the body. And you can even have like amazing images like this, having a volume of the heart or the brain, and measure various properties. Um, MRI started with two, two guys here. First, Paul Lauterbor, that doesn't matter what he did exactly, but he was one of the pioneers in MRI. Uh, he called it segmentography, based on a Greek word. It's good that that uh, name <laughs> didn't catch up. <laughs> and also, Peter Mansfield, uh, that was uh, one, uh, one person that added like, an additional thing that made this MRI actually useful. And these two uh, won the Nobel Prize, and even Peter Mansfield was uh, knighted, and now is Sir Peter Mansfield. So you can see that this is an important topic. But how does it work? Well, most of you know how a concert works, right? You have multiple instruments, and you have different uh, partitures for each one, and you play them all at once. Well, MRI is kind of similar. In the concert, you have this uh, sequence of notes, and you have the instruments here, and you have the uh, sound, like this beautiful sound uh, that is not working. Okay, I will not put a lot of it, because it's going to YouTube. And, uh, <laughs> so yeah, you can imagine you can create beautiful songs with this uh, partitor or sequence of notes. Uh, MRI is kind of similar, but instead of uh, an instrument, you have this uh, scanner that has a lot of components inside, and you control them all independently to produce an image. But instead of like notes, what you have are signals that control each of these components. So it looks more like this, and the sound is not as good. It sounds more like this. <laughs> so, not as good as a, a song. OK, so for the MRI simulation, or virtual MRI experiment, uh, basically you need uh, a few ingredients. One is the phantom or virtual object that has some physical properties uh, defined in each uh, point of uh, space. And you have the sequence that's basically how you control these magnetic fields to produce the image. You put all of that in the scanner, and it produces an image. But that's what people think. It's actually not like that. <laughs> the other scanner thing is actually doing some crazy stuff. 
uh, you are not measuring the image directly. What you're measuring is the magnetization of the spins that are processing due to the magnetic field. So it's quite complicated. But the main point here is not the equation or that you're measuring the magnetization. The main point is that you are having indirect measures of the object. So you have a function here or operator called encoding operator that represents everything that is happening in the MRI. You have the image or the properties and you have the data you, that you're measuring. And the important thing here is that all of, all of the tissues have different magnetic properties here in yellow and you can change the sequence in blue there and produce different types of images that have different information. And this is the part that is very useful uh, uh, clinically. Okay, so what's MRI simulation? Basically, the MRI simulation is how you do this forward problem, or here represented by the encoding operator, in an efficient manner. And instead of the image, you actually get this, the raw data or case space. For those who know about the Fourier transforms, this is kind of similar to the Fourier transform of, of the object. And the inverse problems, or the reconstruction, or how you get the image, it's like this, so you have an optimization problem with a simplified encoding operator that is now linear, so you can have like derivatives and stuff like that, and, and a regularization term or prior knowledge. And you don't have the full Fourier transform space, you have a subsampled uh, space because you want to make it fast, and we all know that it's very slow. Okay, so you're basically going from this to the image or object. And basically, there's two approaches on what you want to reconstruct or get from the MRI. One of them is the weighted image that has all of these magnetic properties like in a soup, like you cannot differentiate between them. They're all together. And on the other hand, you have this Vento box that's very well organized and you have each property in their own component. And there's these two approaches and you can have one or the other. Now it's uh, starting to be more popular, the second approach of having everything with the units and physical meaning, and not so much with a weighted uh, approach. And here I put it as a fun uh, thing that is in the manual of one of these scanners, that the MRI is not a measuring system, so basically what we're doing is not something the MRI was um, developed for. It was developed for this weighted imaging, not for measuring the properties. So you need to do some stuff uh, to disentangle all of these properties. Okay, so amazing. How would, do we measure this weighted image or this map? Well, you go to a paper. Okay, this method gives me this result. Okay, how did they do it? Okay, they use a different scanner from mine. I have a different brand. And in the paper, the <laughs> definition of this sequence is not as good. And not only that, but some parts are proprietary and you cannot even see them. So this is where um, uh, I wanted to create a simulator. This uh, project started in the pandemic where I didn't even have access to a, simulate, uh, sorry, a, a scanner because all of this COVID thing, obviously. I couldn't even access the scanner um, to a scan a healthy volunteer. So I had to do stuff computationally. And another thing is that each scanning hour is pretty costly. So you cannot do a lot of experiments in one person for 10 hours, one, he, he's going to, or she, she's going to get tired, and also is, it has a, like a monetary implication. Okay, so I'm not the first one doing MRI simulators, there's plenty, but for mine, I, I try to target some specific aspects that I think Julia is particularly good at. One is that this proprietary closed uh, version of the sequence um, was, not the approach I wanted to take. I wanted to use open definitions of the sequence that are available. People can program these open uh, definitions of the sequence, post them in, in their papers, and also test them in the scanner directly. And I wanted to, instead of using the scanner, use my simulator and try a lot of things and then put it in the scanner. So you can kind of optimize your sequences. The other thing is that not all the MRI simulators have the eye or the imaging part. So imagine you take a photo and you look at the result and you, and you see this. So it's not ideal, right? <laughs> so the, an MRI simulator needs to include the reconstruction part to get this data and put it as an image. 
And the other thing is that some simulators are not directly simulating these block equations. They are just simplifying uh, linearizing operators. And that is obviously good to make the reconstruction fast, but it's not good to model the system. Uh, and another thing that is in a story that is way too common, I think, is that when you try to install a simulator, this simulator looks very nice. The paper has great results, but it doesn't work. <laughs> The CUDA version was different. They were compiled with this version. The library was something that you cannot install in Ubuntu 22.04 because it's deprecated. So many problems that makes reproducing results very difficult. And the other thing is that when people do their PhD and they develop MRI simulators, uh, they kind of use MATLAB as an interface to C++. And that PhD student or that person needs to be an expert in MRI simulation that, as you already saw, is quite complicated, and also an expert in C++ to make the code fast. So then poor, <laughs> the next poor PhD student comes and spends one year try, trying to understand what the other guy did, so it's a little bit inefficient. And also because some types of people need different things. So for example, students don't care about the efficiency, the extendability, and stuff like that. They just want to play with it. So for that, an easy to use uh, graphical user interface was um, very important. And also, they prefer to do stuff without programming at all. On the other hand, researchers really care about novel things. They want to extend this simulator for their research. If you're not able to do it that easily, they will rewrite their simulator, and that's why there's like 400 of them. And also, it's impossible to extend that simulator if it's not open. How can you add stuff if you don't know what's there? Uh, also, it needs to be easy to reproduce the results. So if you publish something, this is the environment, how I run the code, blah, 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 and you can reproduce the results. That has a, a huge importance in science. And obviously, they want stuff that they will not get by uh, writing their own simulator. So for example, that is being optimized, so it's fast, and it has very accurate and tested results, et cetera. So that's something that is not easy to do uh, from scratch. So it needs to add some benefit for them to consider to use this simulator. OK, so those are the things I wanted to um, target for my simulator. Oh, also, I forgot cross-platform. It's super important that people, especially students, can install this in their computers. And here at the right, there's just a brief landscape of the MRI simulation uh, world. And as you can see, uh, most of them do not satisfy all the requirements. And well, actually none, at least the requirements I set up, because they were developed for different purposes. And now uh, I'm targeting something more general. So remember this, open source, cross-platform, cross Graphical user interface, fast and accurate, and extensible. So how, how do I do this? Well, in this conference, I probably don't need to convince you that Julia is a good programming language for this, right? <laughs> but in the MRI community, I need to explain. <laughs> but yeah, you know, basically, Julia has great GPU support. It's very easy to do multi-threading. Um, graphical user interface uh, is quite easy to do as well. So this is what. Um, and also it's obviously uh, fast, and it has a reproducibility aspect very well uh, developed with the manifest.toml files, etc. So I developed this simulator to accept uh, a few files that are the definition of the sequence, the phantom or virtual object, and this coma simulation block basically generates the data that is also an open standard developed by the MRI community. And you can use already available MRI reconstruction packages. Here, MRI Rico, and that is written in Julia, of course, and can take this raw data and generate an image. And this is all contained in a graphical user interface for people like students to try it and just click buttons and play. OK, this is, uh, <laughs> has a lot of information, but I'll try to go uh, by parts. So the first thing. Uh, Oh, you cannot see. Wait, laser. Here. So the first thing uh, thing I want to mention is the phantom or virtual object. 
So you have one magnetic property for each point in space, basically. And the cool thing about this problem specifically is that the magnetization of the prop or whatever is going to measure uh, the MRI machine uh, is independent from one another. So you can parallelize them. Basically, one pixel is one partial differential equation, and you can solve them, solve them all simultaneously. So this problem is made for parallelization. Uh, so the first thing I did is to separate this object into multiple chunks with uh, the BUS macro, basically, to not add more uh, memory. And all of these chunks are passed to different simulation blocks. What's interesting about the MRI problem is that, is that it has been very well uh, studied. And depending on the sequence, different sections of the sequence, uh, do not need to solve the full block equation. You can solve just one simplified version of it. So if you are able to identify beforehand which parts are easier to solve, you don't need to do the full block simulation. So that's why I did. I, I tried to tag each section of the sequence after discretizing them, um, because we already know the sequence. We don't know. We don't need to do like ad adaptive time stepping and stuff like that. We already know what's the most efficient way to sample this because we know the sequence. It's not something that will um, be a surprise. So we can pre-compute -com pre the uh, time points. We can pre-compute which block uh, of the sequence is calculated in each type of simulation. Uh, so here, one is called excitation, one precession. And we also know in which blocks you actually need to write something. So you, here in MRI, it's called analog to digital converter. But it's basically when you are starting to listen what the signal is, you don't, you're not listening all the time, just in certain parts of the sequence. And when you're listening, you basically save that to a matrix. And this is done uh, in, in, with multiple threads. And each thread writes to a different a matrix that then you can add together. The cool thing about this is that using uh, abstract ar arrays, you can use this in the CPU, but if you initialize everything as uh, CUDA arrays, you're doing everything in the GPU without changing the code at all. And another thing that is very important was the extensibility part. So all of these blocks, or simulation blocks, or simulation types, are specialized but for a, a simulation method an abstract type. So they have as an input an abstract type that the default one is block for the block equations, but you can change it to whatever you want, import all of these, redefine them as you want, but you have the graphical user interface, you have all the reading and writing of the functions and the reconstruction, so you don't need to deal with a lot of stuff they already take care of. OK. so. This sounds nice, but obviously I was coming from MATLAB, and when I tried to pro program something, I don't have all the knowledge to do it efficiently. So the first time, actually, I did it quite inefficiently. In each block, I passed uh, from the CPU to the GPU. So there's a memory transfer. Then uh, the excitation block, I didn't do with the GPU at all. And I cannot uh, overstate um, how useful the NBTX or NSIDE tools uh, where for debugging this. In, in Julia, doing this is so simple. Like you just put a profile macro and you tag with the NBTX range macro uh, each block, and you can easily see which blocks are being uh, done correctly in the GPU, where are the memory allocations, what parts you need to fix. OK, so what, what did I did this? Because the simulator was not faster than the competition, so I wanted to be fast. So I, I basically rewrote the simulation core to do all of this efficiently, replace all the allocations with in-place operations, improve the type stability. Uh, everything now is uh, float 32. You don't need to take care about it. And also, I tried to remove the need for memory transfers. I do have a first memory transfer uh, at the beginning of the simulation. You simulate everything in the GPU, and then you have uh, the, the result. If I'm doing this, um, code that was already fast is now faster. Now it's five times faster just by taking care of this. So now uh, how you can see that is actually better, because this blue uh, part here represents uh, the GPU usage, so the more Blue is better. So if we go back just briefly, uh, here you can see that this blue, there you have memory transfers, a space that is 
just waiting, doing nothing. So it was quite inefficient. And now it's very fast, but it could be faster. And by doing this, we, we compared our simulator with the, the competition, basically. Jambris, that is the most used um, MRI simulator, but it's only uh, paralyzing this in the CPU. Takes about seven minutes for one simulation. And MRI Lab, that is also uh, written in C++ with CUDA, takes about 1.5 for the GP only CPU version. And for the GPU, we are actually faster than these especially written CUDA code. I'm, and I'm using CUDA arrays. I'm not writing a kernel, kernel at all. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but even by doing this with CUDA arrays, it's faster already. But <laughs> it's not useful that it's fast if it's not accurate. I can produce garbage very fast, no? <laughs> so we need to compare our simulator with another one. This Jambris uh, simulator, I didn't explain, but it solves the block equations. Like with the whole equation, it uses an ODE solver. So it's very accurate. And when we compare the results are basically identical. You can see in the bottom um, of the screen, the mean absolute difference in percentage. It is below 0 0.1 in all the cases. Um, we compared this uh, in multiple scenarios, and it was always accurate, but like even 300 times faster. The cool thing is that now that we simulated this with another simulator, you can add this as a test. So in the test, you simulate this, check if it's similar to the thing that it's supposed to be, and if not, it fails. So it has a, uh, a meaning, uh, the test. It's not just calling functions and see if they work. Uh, to test that it was easy to use, we had a student experience with students that were learning about the MRI. And this is the first version of the graphical user interface. Uh, it was slow, it was bad. <laughs> uh, it was developed with Blink to be ex easily extensible. So it's just HTML, CSS. I'm using Bootstrap for the uh, styling. So I, I didn't have to do a lot of stuff. And even with this ugly and not so optimized code, uh, it was um, already like 10 times faster than Jambris. That it was the other simulator that everyone could install, Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, we took the feedback of all the students and improved the graphical user interface. So now it's not only faster, it's more beautiful. <laughs> and, and the idea is that you have like the sequence part that you can just load a file, load a file, load a file, simulate is just a button here, and reconstruct is also a button. And you can see the results here in the image tab. And obviously, MRI people use MATLAB, so we included the um, export to MATLAB option. So you have the results computed in Julia very efficiently, and then you can export them to MATLAB if you want. Coma uh, was thought to be open, so everyone can extend it. Uh, Yesterday, I learned that this is considered a monorepo because it has multiple packages in the same uh, GitHub. And we are using CI for all of them. And we are also uh, testing all of them. And we have very good code coverage for all of the submodules. And most importantly, it's very easy to install. It's just add Coma MRI, and it just works. It works like cross platform. Uh, you don't need to, like, compile stuff in C with the correct version of CUDA. It just works. Uh, another cool thing is that for the documentation, we use Literate and Documenter. So you can generate just one .jl file that has everything for the generation of the documentation. You can also export it as a Jupyter notebook, as a GLU script, and run them in your computer. And you should be able to reproduce the, the results. Um, one thing we want to include is a binder here so you don't need to have Julia installed at all, but that's the next step. Uh, for the test, I already kind of uh, mentioned that, but you can simulate compared to the gold standard and check that the error is not more than 1% or 0.1%, and this is a very good test. And we did this for all the functions in each submodule. And in our experience, one test equals one bug. 
Like every time we added a test, we found a bug in, I know, in Windows in the Julia 1.6 or in Mac with Julia 1.8 in the GUI or in the, it's so useful to use uh, tests. And this is obviously very uh, obvious for you, but in the MRI space, people do not test their code. So it's just buggy. <laughs> And to certify that this is a cross-platform and it works everywhere, even the UI is being tested. And with the CI, we can test it in Julia 1, 1.8, 1.9. Um, and we also can test it in Ubuntu, Windows, and Mac and generate the documentation automatically from uh, using Literate. OK, I'm almost finishing. So I just wanted to briefly mention that the MRI community is taking notice of Julia, and a lot of people are having meetings, one of them, <laughs> me, there in the corner. And we're porting some reconstruction and simulation code to Julia, and it's, it's starting to form an MRI uh, ecosystem. And, and yeah, it's being noticed and it's being used. And this has huge implications in the speed of reconstruction and even if it sounds only a computational uh, problem, it has a huge impact because if you're trying to reconstruct an image and it takes five minutes and you cannot see the result, you cannot repeat that scan. You need to just go with it. But if you can see it in 30 seconds, you can reacquire or play with it a little bit more. So this has a, a lot of implications in the, in the clinic as well. Yeah, I wanted to briefly uh, acknowledge my colleagues at King's College London and also in Chile, and thank you everyone for listening. Great job, Carlos. Great job, Carlos. Uh, and happy to entertain a few questions here. We have we have time. All right, here. Let me. Uh, I'm going to bring the microphone. Oh, here. You hold this one. Hey, um, so yeah, great talk. Uh, I used to work in MRI a little bit. Um, yeah. uh, so my question is like, are people using these tools for um, uh, sequence design and optimization? Because yeah, that, that seemed to me to be a very really big thing um, that you'd like to do with Julia and, uh, and MRI, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So. Um... Generally, the sequence optimization is not being done. So one of the things I, I did, for example, I'm not showing here, is that you can put these objects that are the sequence objects and optimize them using jump or stuff like that. And you can find like optimal with a certain definition of optimal sequences uh, using these uh, simulations. And you can improve the image quality a lot. Um, uh, the other thing that it, the simulations are quite useful is that for example, instead of the weighted image, that is the traditional way of uh, looking at image, images, you want to reconstruct the, the properties, like T1, T2, or the things I showed. You can simulate like all the combinations, T1 and T2, and then just do a dictionary matching and check what the actual properties were. So this is uh, useful, yes, for sequence optimization, but a lot uh, for quantitative imaging as well, and reconstruction to have a more accurate model not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I guess one thing that I thought was really interesting um, about the whole space was there seemed to be it seemed to be wide open to have a joint optimization of the sequence design and the reconstruction. And I was hoping that people would start doing that when I used to work in it. <laughs> oh, can you repeat the question? I think oh, so, well. so like a joint optimization of reconstruction and sequence design. Yeah. And I thought that was like one of the most interesting things people could be doing. Not that the position I had let me do that, but I, I was wondering, I was hoping that you would say, yes, people have started to use these tools you're building to do that. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm not sure if I got it correctly, but oh, I'm sorry. people are doing joint optimization of the sequence and the reconstruction as well. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, joint optimization. Because exactly. like, reconstruction and the sequence like go together hand in hand. Exactly, they're to putting both, both together and they're optimizing the reconstruction with the uh, sequence or the other way around. Yes, people are starting to do that. That's amazing. If you, yeah, if that if your work enables that, that'll be amazing. Yes, well, very nice. Thank you. Hopefully, you can do that with Enzyme. I haven't tested it yet, but oh, yeah, could that be would be a cool. way. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Carlos. Uh,